My name is Tom Lawrence, and I'd like to welcome you to a slightly late start on this uh, Tuesday afternoon in July. Um, I am the chair of the uh, Financial Industry Series, and uh, I'll, I'll be your host this evening. Uh, I know there's a lot of familiar faces here, and there's a lot of empty seats. We, we have to say that it does look like London has been evacuated, but that means there's more um, snacks and drinks after this finishes for us. Um, I want to say a thank you to our uh, very gracious sponsors, which are Deutsche Borsa, London Clearinghouse, and Virginia, amongst the much larger group of other organizations. Um, I'm going to say a little plug for um, our research forum. Uh, we're dedicated to thought leadership and, and to presenting uh, topical events like, like this one. We, we run events like this every uh, six weeks or, or two months, so that's one reason why we're um, a bit like the airport when you come in here, because we want to get your name to make sure we tell you about our next event. Um, uh, following the end of this debate, we are going to have a networking event, and there'll be some drinks and some snacks, so um, these fine people will probably spend a few minutes with us, so if you want to come and talk to them, please make your way. To, to that. Um, I want to uh, also say a big appreciation to the team of people who um, uh, arrived here, the, the team of undergraduate and graduate students that put all this together. Um, we had a bit of a panic at 5.30 when we found no microphones, and we called the audiovisual department, we found that they also had left London because of the Olympics. So um, fortunately, we found some mics hidden in the back room there. Um, and then I want to say an enormous thanks to these stars that we have here this evening. Um, but before I say that, I have to ask you guys just a couple of quick questions. Um, and, and not that we don't like people from certain parts of the world, but is there anybody from the press here? No? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, we're sorry. There's nobody here from the press. Um, uh, up here is um, a... Uh, Mobile, UK mobile phone number for you to text your questions. Um, if you should have some questions and, and you don't want to raise your hand. Uh, so basically, we'll spend about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, uh, with a debate uh, from these fine people, and then we'll uh, start a QA. But at any point in the next hour, you're more than welcome to um, text your questions. Please keep them clean and short. Um, or you can send an email to events at UCL Funds um, with your short and, um, and, and, and polite questions. Um, so I want to thank um, these people. I'll start with Michael Hampton Turner here, who's the director of the city in the Credit Strategy Group. Um, Sarah Colson, who's at Moody's Investor Service, a senior credit officer. Um, Rebecca Healy, who's our moderator tonight, and she's a senior analyst at TAB Group. Um, Kathleen Brook, who's research director at Gain Capital. And my friend Gianluca Benigno, who is a lecturer uh, in economics at the London School of Economics. And um, I will throw the mic to you, Rebecca. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We thought it would be useful to start off with actually seeing where Europe stands currently. And obviously the euphoria that we had um, a short while ago after the second Greek election and the rejection of um, Syriza um, not being able to renegotiate the Troika package, well, that clearly has disappeared in a puff of smoke. The euro is trading at its lowest against the US dollar since June 2010, currently at 120 and sinking. Moody's, we have um, the Sarah to explain the Moody's decision last night to lower the outlook for triple-rated Germany, Netherlands and Luxembourg uh, due to the likelihood of the Brexit um, from the Eurozone, domestic weakness and exposure to Spanish and Italian sovereigns. The politicians are responding with another short sell ban. Will that work? Has it worked in the past? Rumours are rife about the IMF and the ECB losing patience with Greece. Obviously, the Troika have gone again to Athens today to try and find an additional 2.5 billion of cuts, which, given the current environment that the Greeks find themselves in, is optimistic to say the least. 
And then, of course, we have all eyes on Spain. And the current um, debacle, actually, in the bond markets just indicates how difficult the crisis is becoming. We've had another region that's formally requested a bailout, and the likelihood is that the Spanish government will have to go for a full bailout. What will that mean? What will that mean for contagion in Europe, particularly Italy? So, to start off with, we're looking at why are we in this situation? And I think the opening gambit I have for all the panellists tonight is which country do you think is causing the biggest crack in the Eurozone at the moment? And why would you want to take the difference? Sure. I guess the uh, uh, my initial thoughts on, on which country is, is causing the biggest crack is, is I think Spain has been in the, in the has been the country that's been moving the market the most in the last month. And essentially, uh, the markets fear that Spain's sort of on the verge of, uh, of losing access to of losing access to markets. And um, if, you, if you look at the relative size of, of say, Italy, Spain, uh, Portugal, uh, Greece, um, if you add up uh, Ireland, Portugal, and Greece, they're still smaller than uh, uh, Spain. But all those together, they're still smaller than Italy. So, so yeah, um, Spain has been, I thought Spain has been a, a, a potential tipping point uh, uh, for Europe. Markets also, especially in like unknowns, and there's a, there's a lot of question marks unknowns about Spain. We don't really know uh, how bad the situation is in, in some of the uh, regions. We don't know exactly, uh, a, although we've had one one ordered by Oliver um, Wagon, we don't know exactly what the, the situation is uh, uh, for the second order that's coming up. And to be honest, people are a bit, uh, a bit dubious. There's a sort of general assumption that the uh, housing market situation in Spain is much worse uh, than, uh, than it's, it's made out to be. And people familiar with, with Spain, the way the Spanish property market works, sort of know that transaction price, the, the, the price that a, a property is for, is for sale, and the price that actually clears that are two very different things. And this makes it very difficult to, to look at a, a loan book for a bank and say, well, when it's, if we had to, to clear this uh, over the next year, uh, what level could be clearer to it in, in a wind up? So, um, uh, all those things make markets uh, uh, particularly nervous. And um, uh, Spanish banks, uh, in particular, are already pretty filled with gunnels with, with, with Spanish debt. They're being asked by their government to take on more Spanish debt, and they're starting to refuse, which is quite a bad sign. There was an auction last week in which, uh, which almost failed, which uh, auction of Spanish debt, which uh, uh, was very marked by its absence of, of uh, domestic debt buyers. And so so uh, I think right at the moment, uh, Spain has probably got the, the biggest um, The biggest crack. Uh, the biggest crack. Sarah, so, would, you, would you agree with that? Or do you think it's actually started with Greece? Well, I mean, Greece is the country that, of course, kicked off the, the whole crisis. But you know, as, as Michael rightly said, I mean, we've got a whole other order of magnitude difference in the size of dealing with the problem in Greece or Portugal or Ireland, or all three of them, uh, vis a vis dealing with the problem in Spain, which in turn is a whole other order of magnitude difference from Italy. Um, and really, the, the, the game changer is the spread of the crisis of a very acute um, speculation about political uh, of liquidity risk to these very large countries with very large bond markets that become much more complex to be able to say. Right, okay. And Kathleen, uh, is you a similar feeling? Or? I am, in the sense that I, I completely agree with what, what the other panelists have said. However, I think that the uh, the, the core, the, the biggest crack, is actually being caused by Germany. Um, and that northern block, because at the end of the day, with Greece, with essentially with kind of Greece, Portugal, and Ireland, uh, you know, we all thought, certainly in the markets, that you know Germany's there to stand behind them. It's okay. Uh, you come to Spain, completely different story altogether. Um, there is no idea, and there is certainly no uh, clear sign that Germany, you know, will stand behind Spain, that they will add more money to their bailout pots, and that they're willing to do it. I mean, Merkel has an election herself next year. That's true, but I mean, surely, because all the rumblings in the press this weekend have been about um, the German MPs coming out against Greece actually saying, you know, but we should be talking about Brexit now, and, you know, and this really is the end of the line, so they seem to be more focused on actually not standing behind Greece now, which um, 
Absolutely, but it costs a lot more to stand behind Spain. Correct. And then potentially Italy. Um, and it's not just Germany, you know, we are kind of singling them out as kind of the, the largest economy in that northern bloc. It's the Finns, there's, a, there's an election in, in Holland. It's this anti-Euro feeling that I think could actually end up being, being um, you know, the, the biggest fissure in the, in the, in the country bloc. Okay, so Gianluca, for you, which country would be? Yeah, I think, I think it would be the country, actually, I uh, should focus more on the, uh, on the core bloc and uh, their uh, uh, you know, there is this moralistic approach uh, towards uh, third world countries that I think is, uh, is uh, causing the pain to become even uh, bigger and bigger. Um, and uh, especially the uh, ostracism towards uh, ECB intervention, which I think is uh, at this point uh, almost inevitable, but uh, could have uh, and should have uh, been uh, uh, put in place uh, earlier. So that, that's, what, that's what I think. I think that's, uh, so it's more about the fact that actually the northern countries are hampering these attempts to improve the situation. Yes, yes. My, my view is that the big difference between uh, what's happening in Europe and what uh, is happening in uh, here, for example, in the UK or in the United States, is, uh, is the role of the central bank and uh, the ECB is uh, is not guaranteed as a last uh, buyer. The, the sovereign uh, of the Eurozone. And that's, uh, that's a big difference. That's why we are observing these uh, this big spreads. And uh, this uh, doesn't uh, uh, require just a small intervention in the market, but require the commitment to unlimited uh, action. And uh, this commitment actually might result in a, a smaller intervention than the one that uh, has actually occurred so far. So that's, uh, that's what I think. And is this, sorry, is this sort of Constant circle of, of uh, uh, 
um, and which isn't helpful. But to be honest, you know, I feel um, quite a lot of sympathy for, um, uh, for the German and the northern countries because you have quite a difficult dilemma. On the one hand, uh, for, for a German politician, uh, you have to uh, remain power, you have to be in terms of your electorate. You're a weak coalition. Germany is sort of designed as a, as a weak coalition government. It, it constantly has to sort of uh, uh, reinforce and do deals to get everybody, uh, to get everybody along with it. So it's not a case of, of, uh, of them choosing to one thing or another. They have to, uh, you know, these, these, are, these are difficult and big moves that they're being asked to, um, uh, they're being asked to do. And I think the, the uh, from a, you have to think of the, was the psychology uh, of, of politicians. If you're a politician, you, you've worked hard to get where you are, you have to get everybody behind you, and you're, you're asking people to do tough things. In Greece, you're asking people to cut their pensions. People have worked all their life thinking they're going to get uh, a certain deal. You're asking them to say, take 30% off your pension. That's pretty tough. In Germany, you're saying, well, actually, you guys have never benefited from the boom. You've never had this sort of house price bubble. You've never had the, the sort of uh, spending boom that all the rest of these southern Europeans had. But now we want you to pay for their excesses. So I think that's quite a tough ask as well. Um, equally, if you had a, if you had a, a child uh, or a dependent of some description that was spending too much on their credit cards, do you just pay off their credit card and then uh, uh, allow them to, to, to carry on? No, what you need to do first is to change the behavior. Now, the, the, the great tragedy in Greece is, is if Greece did end up exiting and yet failed to do all the reforms that it's planning to do, because it would, it would, um, it would create you know, Drachma, it would be a period of high inflation, you wipe out its savings, you have a little money fleas, it would be quite disastrous. And yet, if you still retain the sort of, uh, the sort of economic system that you have uh, at, at the moment, then you would just create another problem, another 20 years down the line, you would end up in the situation that would be fine in the short term, but longer term, you need to dismantle a lot of the uh, structures that are there and put in new structures that are, um, uh, that are more efficient, that are more modern. And uh, that's, that's going to be a painful process. Um, I actually think it would be better to be done within the euro, but it may not be possible. Because you're, asking, you're asking people a lot of things. And in terms of how do you motivate, um, how do you get these sorts of things done? One of the reasons we've seen too little too late is that essentially, if you're a politician, you're wanting to stay in power, you say, I had to do this to save the euro. I had to, I had to do this action. I had to bail out Greece to, to save us. Or if you're a big politician, um, I didn't want to cut people's pensions, but I had to stay in the euro, otherwise it would have been much worse. So you need the crisis point in order to, uh, in order to get to the extremely unpopular measure. And we've got, we've got extreme, you know, think, think of Southern European countries, they've got nothing but bad options, right? Because you're having to choose between bad options, and uh, you need a crisis to get through. Sorry to interrupt, but isn't that part of the problem at the moment, in that you know, the Spanish government took exceptionally good when they actually had the, the police and the Guardia Civil battling each other against the firemen outside the park, outside the quarters as they were pushing these through. Only a week later to be actually hammered by rockets. I mean, you know, it's, it's almost like the, the old methods are no longer working. It has to change. Um, I, I, I think those, the, the, those things uh, make it more difficult. I think that in, in the case of Spain in particular, there's a there's a big case of, of, of pride, there's a, there's a, uh, a reluctance to, to approach uh, uh, programs and bailouts because uh, it will make politicians unmatchable and also a, there is a sense of uh, you can solve it without outside help and uh, uh, so on. I think that may uh, that will make the pay, but, but you know, I, I, think that does, I think that does make it tougher and, and you know, you've seen some increase. Going back to one of the points that you made earlier. Yeah, can I say something? Yeah. <laughs> Don't share all your views with family. I think that's something. Uh, in the sense that you know, you, you do this analogy uh, with the credit card. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, here there is a debtor and a creditor, and there is someone that has big money to this country, and especially the countries that give big money. You know, the money came from Germany, came from France. I mean, actually, I would argue that it's in their interest uh, to to act so actively in such a way that. Uh, uh, you know, the problem is solved exactly because they are the creditor. There's not, uh, you know, uh, someone else, there's not a party of an intermediate, but uh, they are the ones that are directly involved in terms of flow of funds that have come into, the, for example, the Spanish uh, housing market. It's been financed uh, through 
five years of, of, of austerity. Uh, it's much more popular to go through on a, on a growth ticket or, or uh, with, with other policies that people uh, are getting more excited about. So I think that, that helps to create um, uh, well, weaker democracies, both in Germany but in also places like Ireland. Um, actually, two interesting places where, where it happened. One was in Portugal, which I was forced to me, and the other one was, uh, was in France, where people were a little bit worried that having a um, more uh, left wing group in charge would mean that uh, we need a greater push for um, uh, for growth led strategies and for, for essentially spending money to stimulate, stimulate the economy rather than, than uh, uh, austerity, which is um, okay but hard to achieve. Uh, but actually, it's been that, that's been almost a pleasant surprise and that's been so far that's that's, that's worked out okay. That's just been more, more moderate than uh, 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 we, we expected. Okay, what else has? Oh, okay. But I was, I was just interested that because it seems to me